This week's episodes were brought to you by the generous support of Yukofin. Hey you folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to another episode of our Unity tutorial for beginners on making a board game, the Royal Game of Ur. We're doing a lot of basic Unity stuff in here in the first chapter of this tutorial. The second chapter is going to involve artificial intelligence, and it was probably going to be considerably more complex and a heck of a lot of fun to do. Uh, last episode, we did implement the basics of this dice roller. What we're going to do here is I felt bad that it wasn't a very appealing sort of thing. So we're going to go ahead and add some visuals for our dice rolls in this little box over here. So in our little die roller box right here, what we're going to do is we're going to make it look like we've got our four uh, tetrahedron dice, basically little pyramid things, uh, dice in there. And we're going to have them actually show you what you rolled, which I think is going to be a fair bit more compelling. So in this box, we're going to have... Um, some images in here. Now, I've made some awesome little pictures with my brilliant, amazing graphical set of the different possibilities, and I think I remembered them all, of how you could roll the one. So basically, the top pip, if the top pip here is white, then that means it's worth a one. If it's blank, then it is worth nothing over here. So when you roll, you just look at the top pip on your die and that tells you what you've got or not. And visually from this side, there's three different versions uh, because two of the pips are white and two of them are blank. So if you've got one at the top, you're either gonna have a pip down at the bottom right one on the bottom left, or it's going to be hidden in behind over here. And if it's blank, then it's going to be blank with a pip on the left and one behind, a pip on the right and one behind, or both of them visible over here. Just a little bit of, uh, you know, vague eye candy going on. Now, um, because I uh, set my default when I set up this project as 3D, these things are coming in as a default type texture. But what we need them to be is we need them to be sprites over here for the 2D and UI system. So I'm gonna take all these textures that I went and made, and I'm gonna go ahead and make them sprites. And then I'm gonna hit apply. This changes a couple things about their settings, including their transparency settings. So we can see there's a nice transparent background going on in these things now, which is great. And they're ready to be used as um, UI elements. So in our die roller area over here, what I'm gonna do, and I mean, it could click and drag, but I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna right click. I'm gonna add a UI element, which is an image inside of this. Now, this image gets set to a default size and it's big, but that's okay. We're then gonna go, and for the image, the source image, we're gonna click on a little target here, and we're just gonna take Tetra 1A right now. So you've got the ones and you've got the zeros. So we're just gonna take 1A, it's gonna be fine as a placeholder. Um, I can hit the set native size button, uh, but it's clearly gonna be way too big. So we want this to fit in. In fact, we're gonna want four of these, right? One. There we go, we've got four of these because we've got four little pyramids in here. And obviously we need them to be arranged well. Now we could place them by hand, but we're gonna use a very handy dandy little tool inside of uh, Unity's UI system. We're gonna click on the dice roll over here, and there's two different things we could use for this. We could use the grid or we could use the horizontal layout. We're gonna go ahead and add component to the dice roller sort of parent object here. We're gonna use horizontal layout group because this makes a lot of sense. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna arrange all of the children of this side by side. All right, that's not that's not bad. Um, it's, it's clearly a little too big. Uh, what we could do to force to fit, there's a few different things. Um, I guess with the horizontal layout group is actually a little fuzzier to to get it to work the way I want maybe what we'll do is we'll take this away and instead we'll replace it with a grid and the grid layout group has an excellent advantage in that you can actually specify the size of the cells over here this tells you how big the children images are now we can do a little calculation based on our current you know, height and width and things like that but you know what let's just go ahead and eyeball it I'm going to shrink the x until we have all four of them fitting on one there we go Let's call it, uh, let's set it to 60. And then we'll set the height as well to 60. There we go, that's looking okay. And then we can tune the padding a little bit to make this work, because our object, um, let's, okay, let's tune this height to be exactly 68. We're gonna do the same thing with our, our dice rolling button here. We're gonna make it exactly 68 so it's a little easier to work with. So our dice roller, if it's 68 high, and our cells are listed as being 60 high, so we'll add padding on the top and bottom, equal to four pixels that'll get them nicely centered up that way and i'm just gonna fake it for the left just to try to look at kind of centered excellent okay so there's our dice so when we hit the roll the dice button this dice roller is going to calculate a value but what we're going to get it to do is actually show you 
what the dice would look like over here. So I'm going to go back to my dice roller script over here. All right, so the dice roller script here is rolling the dice. It's storing those values over here and outputting something um, just to confirm what we rolled. Let me go and trim this down because we were doing things that was adding extra noise. There we go. Just put a little debug log to confirm what we have rolled over there. Um, so what I want to do here, update the visuals to show the dice roll. Now, to do, this could include playing an animation, either uh, 2D or 3D, right? We've talked about that before. Here, all we're gonna do is we're gonna set the, um, the dice roll um, visual here to the correct one. So these images over here, we're just going to change what um, what image we want to show for each one of these. Now, I could add a script to each one of these images over here. I think it's probably going to be okay if I just put more stuff in the dice roller. What I'm going to do here is this. I'm going to set up a public array of image. Now, this is going to autocomplete incorrectly. If I do this, it should turn red. Okay, probably will in a second. This is going to be um, dice image one. If I save this, there we go, it turns red. Um, it doesn't know what this um, class is, what this object type is. And the reason for that is we need to include using Unity Engine.UI. This is all the UI classes. If we do that, then image turns green and we're good. So we're gonna have two public arrays. This is gonna be all the images for the dice that have a value of one and all the images that have the value of zero. If you go back into Unity over here, check our inspector dice roller is selected and we look at our dice roller script you can see we've got a couple of different options over here currently they both have a size of zero now what you can do is i can say oh i've got three images for this and i'm going to drag those images that is um oh i think the image actually has to be sorry my bad it's not the image class we want to use, it's the sprite class we want to use for this. I am terribly sorry. I think sprite will work for this. I'm trying to remember. Let's go with it. We can adjust it later. We should wait for it to recompile. Now this is looking for a sprite. Now I can drag the sprite in there. There we go. So that's sprite one, two, and three. And again, you can always hit this little target thing and then pick your correct sprites out that way. Um, we're going to do the same thing for image uh, zero. So here, I'll do this one with this version. So zero A, B, and C. And I mean, you don't need to have the, the same amount for everything. It's okay. This is just some list of images that represent a value of one as opposed to a value of zero. And, you know, hopefully you can draw some sweeter graphics than I, I do over here. So what we're going to do is... Um, well, actually, I think we'll update the image in here, in fact. Because at this point, we have the value for this role. So the way it's going to work is like so. We have four children. Each is an image of the die. So grab that child and update its image component to use the correct sprite is what we're trying to try to do so we can access our children through our transform you don't have to use this but i always like it makes it a little bit more clear that i'm working with this object's transform as opposed to some other objects are in transform. so this dot transform dot get child get child you call it based on a number so we're going to get the first child well which is the zeroth but in fact we're going to use i so we'll go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're going to cycle, or 0, 1, 2, 3. So we're going to cycle through all four children. This is a transform. What we want to do at this point is get the component on this child of type image, because the child we know has an image component. And the image has a sprite value. And we want to set that sprite to something. Now, what do we want to set it to? Well, if our value is equal to zero, then we want to set it to one of our zero type sprites, which is, so we have a whole array of these, dice image zero. So we want to set it, I'll put it on a new line just to keep it going. 
um, here and have it all together. Dice image zero is an array. We want to pick one of these at random. We could just force it to the first one in this array, but we'll pick one at random. So we're going to go random dot range from zero to dice image zero dot length. Now, dice image zero dot length, we know we put three images in there. So the length of this array is three. So this says random dot range zero comma three. Because of the way this works with integers, this will return a value that is zero, one, or two. It won't actually return the number three, which is good because there's three things in this array and they are numbered zero, one, and two. If we try to ask for the, the thing with index of three, that's actually the fourth item in the array, things would break. So this will grab a random image, a random sprite from our array of things with a zero value and then assign it there. We're gonna put in an else and it's gonna be, we're gonna grab this entire code like this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna change it so that it uses dice image one as the source array. And we also have to update here for the length. Now they happen to have the same length, but conceivably we can have more variety of images for some reason um, and they might not match. So now when we roll this, assuming no compilation errors. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna hit play. Let's hit this button. And you can see it's changed. We rolled, and it might be a little hard to see because it's a bit small, admittedly, probably in the recording here, but only this one has a pip on top. All the others don't have a pip on top. You can see though the random value. This is the one on the left. This one has both corners. This one's got the right. So this is a total of one. And indeed, in our debug, we have a rolled of one. Let's hit roll the dice again. Here I've got two of them with the pip on top. Rolled two. Let's hit it again. Uh, only one with the pip on top. One again. Oh, all four on top. Big roll for us. Rolled four over here. That's good. I think what we should do is we should have another little box over here that displays the actual total from all of these bad boys. Um, something like that. Because obviously we need to let the player know what they rolled, right? Um, or we could just have like a really big... Let's see here. Uh, let me add a new UI element of text. What if like this text thing, which again, we're gonna park at the bottom left corner by holding shift and alt and clicking there. What if it's just like a big okay, equal four like this in like a big font? Oh, we gotta change the height. Let me change the height to 68. Um, and I'm gonna tell the font to be middle aligned over here. And yeah, we'll make it bigger. And then we're just gonna take the X position and move it way over here like that. Huh? We're gonna call this element the dice total, right? And we could just have this update like that. I think that would look kind of nice. It's certainly clear. Could be made more visual appealing, but I aim for clarity. As long as it's clear, I'm happy. And then I let someone else do the, the arts work to actually make it, you know, something you could sell maybe. Because <laughs> I will never end up with that. Okay. So this thing here is gonna display the dice total that's in there. A Couple of different ways we can get this value to update. We could either have the dice roller know that it's supposed to update this, or we could have the dice total read from the dice roller. Either way is perfectly fine. Let's do an example of rolling from or reading from the dice roller. So we're gonna have a new component here. This is just gonna be something called dice, dice total display or something like that, okay? Some name for the script, doesn't really matter what it is necessarily, but we'll, we'll see how that works. So this, its job is gonna be to update its text component. Now, a text component is part of the UI system, so we need to include that. And so on every update, it being, it, you know, is, it, does it need to run every update? No, not really, but it doesn't really hurt us. And we're just gonna do this as one example of how to update things. On every update, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get our component of text Again, for optimization, you can cache this, but it's not a big deal in this program. And this has a value called text, and we can set it to anything. Let's say I set it to blah, ASD, like that, okay? Let's say we run this as is. This is a component that exists on this dice total object. If I hit play, it should now say ASD. And it does, hooray, huge success. But we want this to read from our dice roller object over here. So how do we do that? Well, we need to somehow grab a hold of this dice roller script that's instantiated in our thing and read the, the dice total values from that. 
Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. We could have a direct link. We could have all sorts of things. I'm a big fan of having objects try to link themselves whenever possible. In our program, there should ever only ever be one dice roller object. So let's assume we can grab it. So dice roller is the class. We're gonna call this the dice roller. We're gonna have to grab a hold of this somehow. We could make this a public and link it in our inspector. I'll, I'll tell you what, as an example, if we just made this public over here and then went back over to Unity and check our dice total object, you can see on our dice total display script, it's got a field for the dice roller and I could just grab that, drag it in there. Now it's got a reference to that, that has been linked. Okay, but I'm notoriously bad for forgetting to do this. So I tend to not make this public. And instead in the code over here, I say, hey, listen, dice roller, I wanna just automatically find one. I know there's gonna be one in the scene and only one, it's an assumption I can make in this particular scenario. Can't always do that, but in this case, I know it's there. So I'm gonna use the game object class. This is a static function that belongs to a class. We don't need to instantiate a game object to do this. And it's got a variety of different finds and stuff like that. There's one, I'm just gonna start typing type. See, it's got find object of type and find objects of type. This will return an array of everything of certain type. This returns the first one of the type that it finds, which is good enough for us. So find object of type. This is a generic function, which means you have to specify the class in between these angled braces here. So I wanna find object of type dice roller. And this will return a dice roller object, the first one it finds, or null if it doesn't find one. It's going to probably work. You could check at this point if null freak out, but I think we're gonna be okay. So what we're actually gonna to do to set our text is we're gonna set our text to be the equal character uh, followed by space, I think. Equal character followed by a space. We'll see what that looks like. And then we're going to concatenate to that from the dice roller what the dice total is. And that will update in real time. So let's say we hit plus, oh, sorry, play. It sets to zero, which was actually our initial thing. So these initial graphics, we might wanna like, you know what, let's do that. All of our images here for our little pyramids, we're gonna go and set them to tetra zero C is what I'm setting it to. So that it's got all the zero pips at the top and all the, the, the pips at the bottom. It doesn't really matter too much, but it's okay. So that way it's set to zero. We roll the dice and it says one or two or this or that. Now you could have this play in animation. You could have these guys like spin around, you know, roll the dice, these things spin around, do, 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 do. Or instead of spinning, you just have them like randomly spam through all the different variant graphics, do, 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 and then stop on something. And then you get an interesting choice. You could decide whether or not you update this total right away. Like even when the graphics are spinning, the total is there so the player knows what's gonna happen sooner. Or you could have it go like question mark, right? Because you could have something like, with the dice roller, you could have something like is rolling. Public bool is rolling, okay? Um, you could even have it set to like, I don't know, some, some value. And then over in your dice display, you could have something like um, if, the dice roller dot is rolling. So if this is true, you don't explicitly need the true, but sometimes I like to do it a lot because it makes it clear. Else, so if it's not rolling, we grab the actual title or um, the total. If it is rolling, then we just put a question mark for now. Right? So then you can have some sort of system where it's playing some sort of animation while it's playing the animation, the is rolling is set to true. And we get a big question mark. When the animations are done playing, we set is rolling is equal to false. And then we actually put in the true value over here, even though we do know it right away. I'm gonna have it just stay at false to not have that because we don't have an animation. So if we go ahead and just hit play on this again, we're still at the thing where it just instantly sets the graphic and you get your totals instantly. There we go. All right, pretty spiffy. We probably don't need the debug message anymore. So I'm gonna go and remove it so it's not spamming our debug log. Excellent. Okay, let's get our pieces actually movable at this point. So we, um, I'm gonna have, so we've got the board over here. What I'm gonna do is um, each player has six stones, right? We've got our prefabs over here for our stones right there. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get 
six of these stones. Boom. Like this. They don't have to be necessarily named in an appropriate way. That's okay. I'm going to have a empty object over here, which is something like player one stone storage or something. Okay. Partially this is here to keep things organized. So I'm going to take all of these stones and dump them in the stone storage. Um, I'll just reset the position to be zero, zero, zero. So they're centered inside the storage over here. Then what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to, in my scene, I'm going to turn off 2D mode. I'm going to double click over here to zoom into somewhere useful. And I'm going to take the stone storage for player one. I'm gonna, So with the stone storage itself, I'm going to take it, move it over here. And I'm going to set it with a Y of negative one. So it actually is the resting on the table. All the stones, even though the stones themselves are just zero, 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 they look like they're resting on the table. And then what I'll probably do with these guys is scatter, scatter them about. Um, like literally just, I don't know. We'll have to figure out what we do with their actual coordinates. Because stones can get sent back here. So I'd like them to be, you know, not, not on top of each other. Nice little neat. It probably makes sense to have them organized kind of in a grid. Right? Like with all six of them, have them something like this. And then the next one's like this. You know what I mean? So I think what we need is we need to write a little script to position these stones nicely when they're just sitting at the side of the table. Don't you think? I think so. Because what can happen is you can have a stone that enters play, boop, 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 and then your opponent lands on your stone, which knocks your stone off and sends you back down here. Mm hmm. Well, let's worry about that after, but I think stone storage is going to have a script to automatically set these. I think that'll be a later thing, but that's going to be okay. All right, um... So, with our stones, I think they're going to need a little bit of logic, we'll see. But we would like to be able to move them. Um, I think what's going to happen is this. I can foresee, what we when we hit the roll the dice button, we're then going to have to choose a stone to move. Now, you never have to choose where you move the stone, because you can't split up the die rolls. If you get a three, you click on a stone and move it forward three spaces. If you click on one of your stones that are over here, it's just going to go one, two, three, and end up right over there. So, we need the stones to be clickable. Luckily, that should more or less already be uh, well configured for us. Things that have box colliders are very easy to click on because what you can do is you can do a ray cast. Now, one of the things you'll note here is that, or I said box collider, I should have just said colliders. We have a collider in this object. That's what the green circle is. Now, we resized this sphere. We scaled the sphere but scaling the actual sphere doesn't change the sphere collider size. And there's really good reasons as to why that is in terms of optimizations in the system. Now, whether or not we want to resize this is an interesting question. I think we might have to. I'm worried about like clicks going a little bit odd. We actually might be better off with a box collider or even like a mesh collider on this thing or something like that. It'd be nice to scrooch down the sphere collider, but it doesn't it doesn't do that. Um, I'm hmm. Let's say let's what what would happen if I were to remove the sphere collider and add in a mesh collider? How problematic would that be? So a mesh collider uses the actual base mesh as its source for collision detection. Um, it's pretty complicated. Let, let's do it. For, for the sake of true accuracy, we'll use a mesh collider so that the collision box we're clicking is the exact visual here. I think it's going to be fine. It's weird that the, the automatic convexifier doesn't work, and we could certainly uh, uh, make this a lot simpler, but that's all right. Okay, so we've made a change to something. We want to apply this to all the other spheres, so I'm going to hit apply, so the change gets applied to the prefab. Oh, sorry. I was I was turning off the mesh renderer so I could clearly see the collision mesh. we got to turn the mesh renderer back on so we can actually see all of our spheres again, but there we go. All right. 
that's going to be all right there. Okay, so these should be nicely, nicely clickable. So we need to know when someone has rolled the dice. Um, I guess what we need, actually, you know what? I guess we set this to true. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this done rolling. Instead of is rolling, I'm going to call it done rolling. I'm going to set it to false. We're going to have to invert the logic over here. If done rolling is equal to false, then we have a question mark. Because at the start of a player's turn, we haven't done rolling. Now, we may or may not have an animation that affects when done rolling gets set to true. Um... If we had an animation, we'd have to wait for it to finish before we set done rolling, but we can just set it right away. So at this point, done rolling is equal to true, although I won't put it here. I'll put it literally when we're actually done all of these steps over here. Boom. Done rolling is set to true. Um, and probably what we need is something like public void reset or new turn or something like that. And say something like, all right, this is a player's, the start of a new turn. This is the start of a player's turn. Um, we, you know, we don't have a roll for them yet. So if anything else, we set done rolling to false. We might want to update some of the graphics as well or something like that. We'll see how it goes. But now what we end up with is we hit play. We're in question mark mode right away. We roll the dice. The dice roll comes up. We get a three. We would then click on one of our player discs, which would advance our player. Then it would be the second player's turn, at which point this gets reset to a question mark. So maybe we should have a little text on our UI. Again, we'll fill it this 2D mode so we can see a little bit more um, clearly once we set it up. Um, we're going to have just a text element. Again, we'll dock it with Alt and Shift to the bottom left corner over here. And we're going to call this um, Current Player 1. Or something like that. You know, player's turn. It, but current player one's going to be okay. Uh, I'm going to make the font bigger. Now, what will happen is if you make your font too big, you'll see your, your text disappear completely. And the reason for that is your text box isn't big enough. You make it, you know, make it a little taller, make it a little wider. There we go. And you've got that. You can change how it's aligned. Left, right, centered, top, bottom, middle. I think here bottom is going to be fine. Bottom and left. Because then what I'm going to do is just I'm going to raise up the Y position to something like this. And you know what? Maybe give it a little bit of padding on the left side. It is still anchored to the bottom left. Everything we've done so far is anchored to the bottom left corner, which looks about right over here. So that's going to be fine. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be a fair start. We'll, we'll have to move something with the camera and overlay so we can get to these little pieces properly. Something of that nature, but we're going to be okay. So we hit play. We got our question mark. We do that then probably I'm thinking every piece with a valid move maybe gets like a greenish glow around it. Because some pieces might not be movable with a three because one of your own pieces are in the way. So click on one of them that's green, boom. And we get a little animation of it happening. And then it's player two's turn. This gets reset. They roll the dice. They click on one of their pieces. Repeat, 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 repeat. Sounding pretty good to me. Hopefully it's still sounding good to you. Again, we're aiming for relatively beginner friendly tutorial over here. And hopefully we're achieving that without being too slow. Um, and uh, we are definitely advancing in our game. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time. Thank you to all the October patrons who make these videos possible, including these mic check supporters, Yoko Finn, Eric Sumner, Adam Keenan, Davey, Danny Welch, Tiburon, Mighty Mix, Pavel Zdanov, Michael McClintock, Aaron Tyson, 
Roar's Call, Gurko Dries, TNSEE, Jasper Bisgard, Julien Auger Lafont, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Steven Steger, Thomas Oberson, Jason Yanity, Steven Bonnerman, Easter Egg Productions, and Neil Blakely Milner, as well as everyone who likes, favorites, and subscribes to these videos. Thank you very, very much.